Warning, the transformers in this video are powered by mains voltage. Mishandling of such a high voltage can lead to fatal injuries. Whenever you plug an electrical device into an outlet, you probably use them. No matter whether you just want to charge your phone or power your laptop, a transformer will always be used. Their job is to, like the name implies, transform voltages. In your everyday life, they transform the high mains AC voltage into a lower AC voltage that can safely be used by common low voltage devices. Well, that was easy, but why are some transformers smaller than other ones, even though they are used to output more power? And what specifications does a transformer design need to come with to achieve which output voltage and power? Well, hang on, because in this video I will be conducting a couple of tests in order to not only explain how a transformer works, but also to answer the question whether it is easy to create one on your own. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB, who offer a super simple Gerber file upload feature, online PCB viewer to double check your PCBs, an unbeatable price and super fast delivery times. So upload your Gerber files today and test their service for as low as $2. To properly understand how a transformer works, let's firstly open up this one. As you can see, its buildup is not hard to grasp at all. We got a metal core which is made up of electrical steel sheets and two coils which are wrapped around the core. To keep it easy to understand though, we can simplify its structure to a diagram like this, with the mains voltage primary coil on the left side and the lower voltage secondary coil on the right side. Now as a practical example, I will be using this transformer which takes AC 230 volts 50 hertz as an input, which not coincidentally is the mains voltage here in Germany, and outputs AC 13.5 volts with a maximum of 1600 milliamps. So by connecting mains voltage to the primary coil, which you can pretty much always identify by its high resistance compared to the secondary coil, we can measure around 15.4 volts AC RMS at the secondary coil. The way this works is that after applying the mains voltage to the primary coil, a sine current starts flowing through the coil. As you might know, when current flows through a conductor, it creates a magnetic field with a magnetic field strength, magnetic flux density and magnetic flux. If you don't believe me, then feel free to create your own coil with lots of windings and power it with a DC voltage source which basically turns it into an electromagnet. But anyway, the formulas for all the three important magnetic values look like this, with the magnetic flux being the end result. This flux flows through our iron core, which means it reaches our secondary coil. And since we applied an AC voltage to the primary, our flux also changes polarity with the same frequency and shape. Now the missing final piece of this functional principle is the induction law, which says that a voltage is induced into a conductor if the magnetic flux changes over time, which it does. So the induced voltage into the secondary coil is our output voltage, which can ideally be calculated through the number of turns of the primary and secondary coil. Those were the absolute basics of how a transformer works. But we want to dig deeper. To start off, I measured the resistance and inductance of the primary coil, which were around 97 ohm and 5.1 Henry. If we turn those two values into the magnitude of a complex impedance, which I showed you how to do in a previous video, then we end up with a value of 1605 ohm. That means by applying mains voltage, we should get a current flow of around 143 milliamps. But after measuring the current the practical way, we can see that we only got a current flow of 41 milliamps. 
The reason is that the magnetic flux also induces a voltage into the primary coil, which opposes the mains voltage and thus lowers the overall voltage at the primary and thus also the current. You can pretty much say the transformer self-regulates itself, because if the current on the input side would be higher and thus would create a faster changing magnetic flux, we would have a higher induced voltage which once again regulates down the input voltage and thus the current. Next, we can also find out that the transformer uses quite a bit of real input power, even though there is no load connected on the outputs. The reason can be found if we look at the equivalent circuit diagram of a transformer. With no loads, all current flows through the cross path and real power losses only occur at those two resistances. The first one is the copper resistance of the primary coil, which according to our previous measurements should be pretty small. Most power gets wasted through the iron losses, which includes the eddy currents and hysteresis losses. Eddy currents are created by the induction of a voltage into the iron core. And to keep them as small as possible, iron cores are created with separated laminated steel sheets. Hysteresis losses occur while the iron core gets alternatingly magnetized and can easily be spotted in the corresponding BH diagram of the used material. And with that being said, let's hook up this 10 ohm resistor to the secondary coil. The load draws around 1.4 amps at 14 volts at the outputs, while the input current increased to 110 milliamps. What happens is that the secondary current now also creates a magnetic flux, which not only induces a voltage into its own coil and thus lowers the output voltage, but also into the primary coil, which thus increases its overall voltage and therefore lets more current flow on the primary sides. The secondary current with its 1.4 amps is still within the limits of the transformer and this transformation came with an efficiency of around 82%. But if I add a 3.3 ohm resistor to the outputs, we can not only see that the output current is beyond the transformer's limits, but also that the output voltage broke down quite a bit and that the efficiency got lowered to 72%. The reason for the low output voltage could once again be the increased induced voltage of the secondary current. But as we draw more and more current on the input side of the transformer, we could also easily reach the magnetic saturation region of the material. There the change of the magnetic flux density is very small in relation to the changing current, which means way less induced voltages. That means the output voltage breaks down while the input current increases since there is way less voltage opposing the mains voltage and thus we get more real power losses, more heat and possibly the destruction of our transformer. To avoid this problem we can once again have a look at our induction voltage formula, which we want to be high. The first solution is to increase the cross section area of the iron core which is why mains voltage transformers who have a bigger iron core will always be able to push more power than smaller ones. The other practical solution is to decrease the time, or in other words increase the frequency, which is why switch mode power supplies which use a frequency of for example 30 kHz can be built with such a small cross section area. But then again the hysteresis and eddy current losses increase proportional with the frequency, which is why their material is made up of ferrites, which are less conductive. A disadvantage of ferrites though is their smaller maximum magnetic flux density of around 0.5 tesla, while electrical steel sheets can reach values of around 1.5 to 2 tesla. The last important property of a transformer we have to talk about is the leakage flux, which if too high can lower the output voltage of a transformer substantially. That is also why we use iron or ferrite cores with a high magnetic permeability 
to basically keep the magnetic resistance low in order to force most of the magnetic flux through them. But you can learn much more about this topic if you watch my wireless power videos. And with that being said, you are now familiar with pretty much all the theory and formulas you need to design a basic transformer. Which leads to the question whether it is easy to make your own. Well, if you can get your hands on electrical steel sheets that come with proper documentation, then there are handy formulas to calculate all the important parameters of a transformer. Which means it is pretty easy. But since the core material is often not that easy to find, it can be quite hard to reuse an old transformer core, which I had to experience by myself while creating this video. But I will be talking about creating a DIY transformer and even a 3D printed one with ferromagnetic filament in the second part of this transformer adventure video series. Until then, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hitting the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time!